Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, I wanted to give you just a little bit of the history of this project <laughs> before I dive into my analyses um, to tell you that my interest in this fiction dates actually back to my um, grad school days when I was first exposed to a book by Marie-Céline Agnon called Le Livre d'Emma, The Book of Emma, which is a really powerful um, and dark story that tells the story of Emma, who is a Montreal-based woman of Haitian descent who is in a mental ward. Come on in, Mimen. Um, and we learn her story through the eyes of Flore, an interpreter, who has been hired by her psychiatrist to interpret for her from Creole to French because Emma has stopped, has refused to speak French. She stopped speaking French and she only speaks in Creole. She's actually incarcerated because she's going on trial for infanticide. Um, and so they're trying to find out if she's psychologically fit to stand trial and also to find out kind of what the story is about this. Um, and through the novel, we learn slowly but surely that it is probable that Emma did commit this infanticide, but that it was a response um, to the fact that her discourse as a black woman who's trying to make the true history come to light about Haiti and slavery and the history of slavery in Haiti has been systematically erased by the society that she's trying to present it to. Her doctoral thesis in history was rejected. Um, and so this sort of psychic break is pointed at in the book that it comes it comes from her sort of inability to make herself be heard. And we're led to believe that she did probably commit the infanticide of her infant daughter because she did not want that infant daughter to be systematically erased by society. So it was an extremely powerful book, um, a really dark but really amazing book that I would recommend. And we do have a copy, I think, in English in the library. But it made me want to read more of, of my silly annual's fiction. And I, um, my dissertation was on the representation of psychic space on the theatrical stage in contemporary theater. So that wasn't my focus at that point in grad school, but I was working on issues of, of madness and psychic distress. So um, once I started at Elon, I began to read a little bit more um, of Agnon's work. And a lot of her work, her post livre de ma work, deals with uh, the traumatic period of the Duvalier dictatorships in Haiti. Um, and her characters have this tendency to suffer from a type of psychic paralysis um, because they carry too much personal memory there where historical memory is trying to cover over and erase. And there is not enough. The history writer's tendency to forget um, what people can't forget, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and so all of this in the face of a surface level, sometimes semblance of forgetting. So um, she says, for example, and I'm quoting um, a text, we went to school and there too, we pretended to have forgotten everything about the night before and its terrors. And that's one of in, in one of her short stories that talks about the arrival of the Tonton Makut soldiers um, in her home when she was a child. So there's this surface level semblance of forgetting, but there is an in individual incapacity to forget. And then in, during my teaching sabbatical, um, I was able to spend a lot more time reading her work and, and I presented it on a conference on this book, An Alligator Nommé Rosa, An Alligator Named Rosa, which tells the story of one of the chiefs of um, Duvalier's uh, Tonton Macoud militia forces that basically arrested and tortured with impunity anyone who was suspected of being against the regime. Um, they estimate that tens of thousands of people were probably killed during the 29 years that they, the father and son were in power. Um, and I was able to go to Emory, which is my graduate alma mater, to hear Danny Laferriere speak, who is a very um, widely acclaimed, uh, also author of Haitian descent, who is settled in Montreal. And in a response to a question that was asked to him by the audience about the Haitians' response to Baby Duck's return to Haiti, which he had just, he had just gone back after years of exile in France, Laferriere said, and this was an off-the-cuff remark, he was just there, he said, les Haitiens n'ont pas de mémoire. Haitians don't have memory. And I was just kind of stopped right there because it, it, was, it was clear that after, as he explained, what he meant was that the Haitian capacity to get beyond and to push past these things was actually their strength. He was saying that what they could do is ignore Baby Duck, remove him from their discourse, mm -hmm. and therefore remove his power. So that's what kind of his argument was. They don't have memory because you know, if they, if they erase him, then he has no power over them. Um, and, but it was incredibly striking to me, having just been 
really fully immersed in Mariceliano books where nobody's erasing anything um, or history is erasing things, but individuals certainly are encumbered by memory. So I wanted to, what this springs from is my desire to um, figure out if there's a theoretical difference in their two approaches to treating memory in their works. And um, that's kind of where I am. I'm at that moment of close reading. And so um, by reading with you today a little bit from An Alligator de Merose, Le Silence comme le sang, Silence like blood, An Alligator de Merose, and La Ferrière's um, Primaire de Sea Winning, Enigme du Retour, The Enigme of the Return. And La Ferrière was just elected to the Academy Francaise. You know, he's a huge international figure now. Um, he's, a, he's a really important author. Um, and his way of looking at things is quite different from Agnon's. So that's what we'll look through today. We'll talk about those and try to theorize kind of where this came from. Um, a couple of important dates for you. If you, I, don't, I didn't know what my audience was going to know about Haitian history um, coming in here. So Francois Duvalier declared himself president for life. He ruled from 1957 to 1971. And then he handed his legacy on to his son, who was 19 years old at the time, who was really not at all politically involved at the time when he became the leader of Haiti and um, sort of continued on his father's path, but in, in different ways. Um, and in 1976, uh, Haitian journalist Gaston Raymond, who was a friend and colleague of Danny Laferriere's, was murdered amongst a couple of other journalists. And that was what precipitated um, Laferriere's f flight to first Miami and then to um, Montreal. So. <clears throat> What we're looking at here are two authors with very distinct literary voices whose biographies share certain elements in common. They were both born in 1953 and were exiled because of Duvalier dictatorships. Um, Agnon left Haiti in 1970 at the age of 17 and Laferriere in 76 at the age of 23. Um, they were both reared by women um, and sort of molded by absent paternal figures who were either dead or in exile. Um, and they both have authors, um, protagonists, who struggle personally with the tension between memory and forgetting. Um, nearly all of Agnon's works treat in one form or another central, the central traumas of Haiti, either slavery or the um, Duvalier dictatorships. And La Ferrière's, which I've not yet examined as thoroughly, I'm really focusing on this, but he has written a large number of novels that have been qualified as an autobiographie américaine, an American autobiography, in which he says there is an I narrator who could be me, but who isn't, and who, and who frequently is named Denny, but who could be me, who could be me, who is giving what he sees as the emotional truth of his life without necessarily giving the historical truth or the historical exact accounts of the autobiographical elements of his own life. So he's giving, he, he claims to be portraying emotional truth in his novels. So as I said, I'm going to try to theorize in this presentation how the two authors represent the tension between memory and forgetting as it relates to the Duvalier dictatorships and also how and why their two perspectives differ. Um, in order to do that, I'll look back at the, I'll look at these three works, An Alligator no Me Rosa, Le Silence Comme Le Son, and L'Enigme du Retour. Um, and then one quick word about French style presentations is that French, the French don't beat you over the head with their thesis. They don't they don't typically structure things in ways that it's, I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I tell you, and then I tell you what I told you. They kind of <laughs> build. So I'm going to build to what I think is my theory by going through the text first, digging into the text with you first, and then build to what I think this all might possibly mean and where I want to go in the future, just so you're not looking for that, right, for me to hit you on the head with it right away. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so what are some of the unifying themes of these works? So when your childhood, your adolescence, and your adulthood are basically determined by external forces um, of a dictatorship that is um, silencing the entire country around you, we see unified themes in their, in their works of childhood terror, of silence, of fear, and problematic and troublesome memories. Um, but after that, the ways of looking at it quite, are quite different. So for example, um, Agnon, after the arrival of a band of Makut, so when I say Tonton Makut, I'm talking about the Volontaires de la Sécurité Nationale, the National Security Volunteers, who were basically bands of thugs, men and women, who would arrest with impunity, torture, and disappear people. They made people disappear um, for many, many years. And so the Makut, and they were working under the Duvaliers. So after the arrival of a band of Makut who evicts the narrator's family from her home, the character, one of her characters in Le Silence Comme Le Son, says, um, Ah, my English ones are over here. The little 
daily moments of happiness had gradually given over to a mute distress, and sometimes I'm giving you two options for translation, or despair, I had the impression that they were all afflicted with a shameful illness for which the only remedy was silence or flight. Um, and Laferriere's narrator talks about how the voice of the regime invaded the house via the radio. And he says, it was necessary to pretend to listen so that the neighbors couldn't suspect us of not adhering to the regime. So we turned up the volume. Our neighbors did the same, an atmosphere of collective paranoia. Those were the dark years. We got a chill in the spine every time we heard classical music. Right afterwards, they announced a failed coup d'etat, which was always a pretext for carnage. I ended up associating classical music with violent death. So for both of these authors, the space of discourse is inhibited by the presence of the regime, and it's impossible to talk openly about what's occurring in life around you. So imagine a child who can't actually ask his or her parents what's happening, who's witnessing houses being burned down the street and can't say because the parents, if they're overheard saying anything against the regime, are worried that they'll be next. Um, so uh, this, these are the kind of unifying themes that are around their work, but the narrative structure of them is quite different. So I'm going to start with La Ferrière's L'Énigme du Retour. The narrative structure of L'Énigme du Retour is actually launched by the narrator's hearing of his father's death in exile in Brooklyn while he's living in Montreal. And the retour, or the return, is his voyage to Brooklyn to bury his father, meet with his uncles, and then to take the news of his, his father's death back to his mother in Haiti. And his father has, and mother have not seen each other since his father was exiled under Francois Duvalier, under the first Duvalier. So she's been living alone with her daughters. And the son was then exiled by Jean-Claude Duvalier. Um, so the men have been absent. And um, the narrator, Danny, comments on several occasions that the memory of the past in the book is too great a weight to carry for himself, for his dead father, and for many other Haitians. But the ways in which his characters deal with the weight of that memory differ. His father dealt or refused to deal with his past through the physical and emotional separation from his family in his home country. Danny tells us, um, I had knocked on his door a few years ago. He hadn't answered. I knew he was in the bedroom. I heard him breathing behind the door. Since I had made the trip from Montreal, I insisted I still hear him yelling that he'd never had a child or a wife or a country. I had arrived too late. The pain of living far from his people had become so intolerable that he had to, had to erase his past from his memory. So the erasure of the past is presented here as a psychic defense mechanism um, for the father, but at the same time is a, as a break with reality that signifies his madness. The father, Windsor, who had lived in a nearly empty room in Brooklyn, walked back and forth between Brooklyn and Manhattan every day for 20 years. And by walking back and forth between these islands, it's as if he were trying symbolically to return to the island that he had had to leave. Um, an incessant repetition that demonstrates the high price that he paid for the erasure of his past. The only concrete object that remains of the father figure is a suitcase that's been locked up in a strong vault in Chase Manhattan Bank. And since the narrator Danny has the same name as his father, he's able to get access to it. They're both named Windsor Le Ferrier. And so he and his uncles go to the bank to get the suitcase. And they can't figure out the secret code to open it. So they can't get it open. And they can't leave with it because that would require more additional security questions that would reveal that he's actually not the true um, Danny Laferriere or the true Windsor Laferriere. So his uncles are disappointed, but he himself is actually relieved. He says, um, my uncles, as if dazed before the steel door, and me rather light not to have to carry such a weight, the suitcase of aborted dreams. Mm -hmm. um, and an interesting thing that we could spend an entire other talk talking about is the form of L'Enigme du Retour, because it's actually a novel written in verse, partially written in verse. So um, that's why you have the lashes there. There are parts that are more prose, and then there are parts that are in verse. Um, so Danny's attitude when confronted with this missed opportunity to gain a greater knowledge of his father demonstrates his desire to live for himself, free not to carry the weight of his father's exile. Later in the novel, however, he still asks himself questions about the contents of the suitcase. When he meets his father's best friend, Francois, um, back in Haiti, he asks him what he thinks might have been in the suitcase. And, his, and Francois responds with a different, um, a different type of response, which I found really, it's a really wonderful scene in the book. He says, oh, he says, chasing the chickens. The man has become a chicken farmer. <laughs> and he was one of the intellectuals that was fighting against the regime. I don't know. I got rid of everything that was cumbersome to me, and the past was the heaviest. Mm -hmm. Leaving Paul Prince, all I brought with me was my own cadaver. But your father, he was a historian. Maybe it was documents. But let's forget all that. Mm. 
there seems to be a small but profound difference between effacer, which is to erase the past, and se débarrasser de, or to get rid of it. Um, se débarrasser, effacer the past, as Windsor did, signifies a break with reality that leads to this mental disruption. And se débarrasser suggests that one has pushed it aside in order to live more fully in the present. By specifying that Windsor was a historian, Francois seems to suggest that too close a relationship or involvement with the traumatic past can push one towards the necessity of a rupture with reality. By placing his history in the vault at the bank, Windsor did effectively erase it because it is un inaccessible to anyone now. And so by reinforcing the necessity of forgetting or getting rid of rather than erasing, Francois concentrates on his own simple present that he finds satisfying. Ici je vis, aujourd'hui je vis ici avec ma petite fille. Today I live here with my granddaughter, surrounded by insatiable chickens that I have to feed at all hours, <laughs> illiterate presents that, presents that I help to write claims, so he's helping them write any kind of official documents that they have to do, and loud street vendors who never stop jabbering from morning to night, and that's all that I desire. Um, so the satisfaction of living fully in the present is something that the narrator seeks as well by avoiding spending too much time dwelling on his memories. His return to Haiti, however, thaws things that he had successfully frozen in Canada. This is the language that he uses. All the things that I had emptied from my mind there in Canada in order to avoid being bound by nostalgia have a concrete presence here. They had taken refuge in my body where the cold had frozen them. My body is heating up little by little and my memory thaws to become this little puddle mm -hmm. in the bed. Um, during his exile, it was necessary for Denny to seek a certain psychological distance from his memories in order to be able to move forward. He argues that nostalgia can paralyze the exile, and Laferriere's narrator avoids stasis as much as possible. He prefers to consider his own exile as a voyage or a journey. And you can't travel if you're trussed up and bound by the past. That verb ligoté is not just bound up, but it's really like really tied up, pretty tight, trussed up, kind of. Um, so what's the relationship that Leferriere's narrator cultivates with his traumatic memories? A very personal one that can be summed up by these verses in which he explains his philosophy, and I, I um, find it really important. This is kind of, I would say, Leferriere's entire philosophy regarding the dictatorship is, the most subversive thing there is, and I spend my life saying it, is to do everything to be happy in the dictator's face. The dictator demands to be the center of our life, and the best thing I did in mine was to get him out of my existence. I admit that in order to do that, I had to throw out, sometimes, the baby with the bathwater. Um, so in order to get the dictator out of his existence, the narrator avoids confronting certain elements of his past. He attempts to live fully in the present, but he recognizes that that comes at a cost. The baby with the bathwater might be the close relationships that he once enjoyed with his mother and his sisters. Um, and he says at one point in the novel, when he's back in his hotel, he says, J'avais oublié le goût de la mangue à midi. I had forgotten the taste of a mango at noon. So this relationship to his homeland that he has is, he's had, in order to get rid of the dictator, he's had to put that behind him also. So for La Feria, a writer's greatest weapon is the power that he has to eliminate the dictator from his discourse. By refusing to name him, he takes away his power to impact his present life and his significance. He talks openly about this um, weapon in an interview that I think is, is really telling and sort of talks about um, the ways in which Haitians are looking at these trauma traumatic pasts differently. And it's kind of a long citation, but I think you have it on your page, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll read it to you, but one mustn't forget that there are always two narrators in my novels. There is a singular narrator, who could be me, who uses autobiographic elements linked to my perception of the world, and this narrator is in a struggle with a dictator who wants to impose a way of life upon him. Exile is a consequence of the dictatorship. One doesn't exile oneself, one is put into exile. But this narrator has always refused to consider himself in exile, preferring instead to define himself as a voyager or a traveler. For a long time, I was attentive to this difference between voyage and exile. Next, there is a collective narrator who carries the drama of those who suffered exile and who themselves chose to define themselves as exiled. I could not impose my notion of voyage on them because in calling themselves exiles, they called in the same breath for the punishment of the dictator even while making him into a monster. If we are on a voyage, there is no dictator. But for those who had a political vision of the affair, it was very important that the monstrous face of the dictator appear on the international scene. I couldn't continue to refuse the, refuse the word exile. But in my own case, it was never a question of exile because in my own personal struggle, I had other arms to combat the dictator. I could not name him. Or to be understood, I could choose 
not to name him. <clears throat> so the very personal struggle of Leferriere's narrator aligns with his own struggle, combat the dictatorship by refusing to give it a voice in his own dis discourse. It's from this perspective that Leferriere's enigmatic declaration that Haitians have no memory makes sense. The choice, the conscious decision not to remember or to name, erases the dictator's importance and his power. Maricely Agnon's uh, writings take a very different approach to the same questions by underscoring the danger of pushing this erasure to, of the dictator too far. After all, erasing him also means offering him a sort of impunity, which Leferriere recognizes very well, as he says in the, in the quotation of, from the interview. Agnon's novel An Alligator Nomi Rosa stages the dangerous tension between an absence of historical memory and the overpowering presence of personal memory. It also stages the, inst the psychological instability of those who have too much memory and those who have attempted to wipe out their own pasts. So the main plot of An Alligator Named Rosa is that Antoine, who witnessed his entire family being murdered by the Tonton Macoute as he was hiding in the bushes as a 12-year-old, uh, by Rosa, who was one of the chiefs of the Volontaire de la Sécurité Nationale, the Tonton Macoute, and who is based on a, on a historical figure. There are descriptions in the novel that are actually really awful. I didn't give you any of those today. Um, he has spent his entire life trying to find Rosa, who escaped and is living in exile in France. And he finally finds her, and he manages to get himself hired as her night nurse. She's basically incapacitated now. She's in a bed, she's handicapped, she's being taken care of by her adopted niece, who hates her but can't abandon her because of the weight of history, basically. And so the niece, Laura, has no idea that Antoine has this history with Rosa. And so he gets there, and his plan is, okay, I'll feed her, I'll do everything, but I will make her admit her crimes, and I will make her write it all down, and, or I will write it all down for her, and you know, I will get some kind of closure, I will get some kind of justice. But what happens is, of course, things don't happen the way he wants them to. Rosa doesn't cooperate at all. Um, and the paper that I delivered when I was working on that text uh, was about the dehumanization of these characters by the lack of bringing this into light um, everything that happened. So obviously the, the torturers are represented as inhumane and inhuman, but also the danger that happens when people are not prosecuted, when there is no resolution, is that the victims become, lose their humanity. And the book has literally over a hundred animal metaphors in which the people are being, um, being compared to losing their humanity with these animal metaphors. So um, what, what I would like to show here are a couple of examples of how now he's completely trapped and how it's qu quite different from the way that um, La Ferrière imagines the thing. So when Antoine gets what he wants, it doesn't turn out the way he thinks and hopes that it will. Um, and he, here, here he is in Rosa's house now as her night nurse. Despite Antoine's efforts, he cannot fall asleep. Terrified, he feels he's drowning, witnessing impotent his own sinking into the burning sand of memories. He's in pain, rolling from one side to another of the bed, Won over by this sterile agitation, he gets up, paces back and forth, bites his nails, goes back to bed. The hours flow by slowly. Irreparably, they string out and stop at the hour of his childhood that never leaves him. So Antoine, haunted both by his past and by Rose's impunity, he cannot live in the present. Um, this, and this emphasis on the sterile agitation is the exact opposite of La Ferrière's idea of voyage. So move away, move forward. So he's in constant movement, but that takes him nowhere because he's basically stopped at this moment of his childhood um, when his family was killed. So his co-protagonist, Laura, demonstrates an attitude that's closer to the one that's seemingly condoned by Le Ferrier's work, but in Agnon's case, this attitude is criticized rather than valued. She greatly doubted, and this is Laura thinking, she greatly doubted that Lo Rosa's crimes come to haunt her. And then, as a human being, don't we have the possibility to direct our memory according to our will, to select what must encumber it or not? Isn't that in reality what she had always done? Get by in spite of herself? Foul betrayal of the soul, a voice buried in her retorts. That was the price of survival, Laura. Where would you have gotten the strength to rebuild a new life? Because there is this question of why does Laura stay with Rosa when she knows that Rosa was a torturer, basically. But she doesn't know where else to go. And she learns through Antoine that the reason that she didn't have parents was because Rosa was responsible for their deaths. But this is something that she must have always partially known, but couldn't bring herself to consciously know. So 
<clears throat> Laura's fortress of self-justifications can't withstand Antoine's assaults on it. He forces her to confront her past, and for a time, each of them loses the capacity to live in the present. They spend their days in constant battle with the past. For them, the day-to-day -day no longer exists. No more day, no more night. Inside them, the irreparable debacle. All these memories, sometimes deformed, sometimes intact, grimacing shadows flowing out, rushing forth in an obsessive tumult that fills their bodies. They no longer know how to live the sadness and this feeling of the irreparable that is reborn every time they evoke their plundered childhood undermines their strength. So Agnol represents their incapacity to come to terms with the past as an erasure of the national, natural distinctions of time. There's no day to day, there's no day, there's no night. There are too many memories, too much pain. And the only image of rebirth in this passage is the rebirth of, of what's irreparable. It's constantly being reinforced as something that can't be fixed. They become physically ill from the overwhelming presence of their personal memories. <clears throat> but this illness is linked to the big, big H history not having given them any justice or voice. Um, so for these reasons, they're stuck. And this is something that we see in other characters of, of um, Agnès also. In the short story, The House Facing the Sea, Agnès also evokes the prison of personal memories. So Antoine and Laura are in a prison, a time prison. And um, the character in this play, uh, in this short story, is also in prison. For Mama and me, who have nothing left to cherish, not even initials engraved on the stone in a cemetery, the potholed streets, the infinite murmur of the pebbled shore, and the memories, that's all that we have. We cannot abandon them. Memories are awful jailers and horrible tyrants. They torment us, pursue us, possess us, and regulate our existence since that day. Because of them, Mama and me, we have become mute, like rocks knowing no other language than the one that they dictate us. So the memories of the trauma have become as tyrannical as the dictators themselves. They are jailers and tyrants, and even the verb dictate at the end of the passage shows that omnipresent threat of that which takes away words and reduces the human beings to silence. Both of these authors demonstrate in their works that t this tension between remembering and forgetting, and they each express in different ways that too much memory inhibits our capacity to live fully in the present. In the present. But where La Feria focuses on the importance of an individual quest for happiness in spite of a traumatic past, Agnon calls for the punishment of the perpetrators and questions the wisdom of historical and personal silence about the Duvalier. This shows a certain fundamental difference between their two approaches. For Agnon, to give voice to the victims who were reduced to silence by the dictator. For La Feria, to take away the voice and thus the power of the dictator. So for Agnon, this collective vision of those who militantly seek to advance the cause of those who were reduced to silence. And for La Verrière, the personal vision of someone who chooses to live in spite of the dictator and thus to cut off his voice. So when La Ferrière declares that Haitians have no memory, he's evoking his own quest for happiness and his own mode of psychic survival, which is shared by some of his characters and doubtless by many Haitians. But it's also important to problematize that declaration and recognize that for some, erasing the dictator equals erasing his crimes, thus offering him a form of impunity. Marie-Celie, Agnon's work seeks justice through discourse. In An Alligator Nomé Rosa, Antoine wants Rosa to admit her crimes. That's the only way he thinks that he can find peace. In the end, through his discussions with Laura, they don't get what they want from Rosa, but they do drop her off at a hospice place and leave her to die. So they do escape from the prison of her presence and sort of there's I won't say that it's a highly hopeful ending, but there is hope that because they have been able to talk to each other and bring this out to light and the, thought about the possibility of handing over Antoine's archives to someone else and both gotten their physical distance from Rosa, that there is, there is a possibility of a future for the two of them. Um, these two visions, to get rid of the past, move on, live in the present, versus confront the uh, past, or to seek justice through mu meaningful discourse, they're not only present, present in this literature, but also in the journalistic responses to Duvalier's death. So when I started this project, I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, two weeks before I was scheduled to present the first version of this at a conference, Duvalier died mm -hmm. suddenly of a heart attack on October 4th, 2014. Um, so I did a little bit of digging into the um, journalistic accounts of what was happening uh, afterwards, just to see what types of reactions one could see. Um, and here I have a, a little bit of you know, further food for thought related to that. So in an editorial published three days after Duvalier's death, France Duval, who's the editor-in-chief of the Haitian newspaper Le Nouvelliste, um, which is one of the national newspapers, pointed out the danger of fighting over whether or not to offer Duvalier a state funeral as a distraction from the imperative to combat the attitudes that allowed Duvalierism to flourish. So he didn't believe that there should be a state funeral, but he said, 
if we keep talking about that, we're, we're not talking about what the really important thing is. And I love the sentence, les blah 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 font florer sur les bords du <laughs> volcan où nous dansons. So the blah blah blahs are prospering or flourishing on the edge of this volcano where we're dancing and about to fall in. Um, aside from those who are debating and position, positioning for justice, the city, the country, quietly moves on to something else, to more immediate concerns. Duvalier sinks into the folds of memory. He takes his place in the void or in nothingness um, with his death. So while Duval points out this Haitian tendency to move on that seems to support Laferriere's claim, he also proposes that there is still a combat to be fought that is indeed linked to the Duvalier's leg legacy. What's left of his reign that merits celebrations or reminiscences? Nothing. Nothing unless it be that unfortunate and worrisome flash that crosses the mind of every leader from here and makes him believe that he is or can be master of lives, of goods, dispenser of benefits, omniscient, sole judge of good and evil. Duvalier is dead and he leaves us the worst of his regime, the little eternal flame of desire to dominate others or the other for the wrong reasons. It's to be meditated upon and to be combated again and again. So that's why he's sort of against this, let's not argue about whether or not he has a state funeral, but let's remember the danger that is still here. Um, in the comments that follow Duval's article online, there are those who criticize him for minimizing, minimizing the discussions about the state funeral, um, and those who applaud him for pointing out the danger of collective amnesia about the larger battle. For Lionel Trouillot, a fellow journalist at Le Nouvelliste, um, Baby Doc was un tigre tendre a pale-faced tiger. And while Trouillot briefly deplores the fact that his death deprived his victims from seeing him face justice, his article's main plea is that the government not offer a state funeral, which he did not in the end receive. All that we ask of the current power or government is that they not impose the passage of his remains amongst us as a hero, as a man of high virtue, it will be better for all the dead. For him, we won't be obliged to denounce at each acclamation, but only at the call of duty of remembrance. And I'm going to have to explain this a little bit because the French is a little twisted. For Gazne Raymond, Auguste Ténor, the school children of Gonaïve, these are all victims. So many unburied dead. For history, a former pale-skinned dictator who was nothing but an inheritor has just died. Without actually freeing him from blame, let us let him repose in his insignificance. Um, and to explain what he's saying here, he, he opens the article by saying that the Haitians have understood something that the Duvaliers did not, and it's that someone should be at peace when they die. So all of their victims were not necessarily, did not die in peaceful places, but Haitians are content to let them just die. And that, that's sort of what he's arguing for. So he's saying, when he says, for him, who we won't be obliged to denounce at each acclamation, he's saying, if you give him a state funeral, we will be out there picketing it. But if you just let him pass quietly into the night, then the only times when we'll be required to call out against him are for the duty of remembrance on the anniversary, when we'll be talking about our friends, etc. But we won't have to defame the dead, which is something that he doesn't want to do. Um, so <clears throat> for Trouillot, a state funeral would force those who would rather keep silent and respectful to, de to denounce him. Um, his argument, like Laferriere's and Duval's, is to erase him from discourse and condemn him into nothingness. <clears throat> While Duval and Troyo both condemn Duvalier's actions and even evoke the duty to remember the victims of the regimes, they do not explicitly call for continued criminal prosecution of Duvalieriste. In other voices, either in the comments to Duval and Troyo's articles from or from alternative press organizations, such as Alter Press, point out the absolute necessity of not forgetting. Daniel Magloire, who is the head of the Collectif Contre l'Impunité, so the Collect Collectivity Against Impunity, which is a human rights organization that's seeking prosecution for the crimes, said, a certain rhetoric would have us believe that a page has been turned with the death of the ex-tyrant. This is not the case, because the mechanisms of the dictatorship have not been brought to light. The balance sheet of the extortions committed has not been drawn up. The responsibilities have not been duly established. The truth has not been brought to light, and the duty of memory or remembrance remains um, an absolute necessity. And she uses two verbs that mean remain, actually. So it would be something like remains and dwells with us as an absolute necessity. So <clears throat> these accounts from the Haitian media show us that literature is not the only textual space in which Haitians are struggling to, to confront their past. It also shows us that, as Le Ferrière himself says, the past, which defines our way of understanding the present, does not have the same density for everyone. Um, 
n'a pas la même densité pour tout le monde. It's always prettier in French. Um, <laughs> so um, that's kind of the end of where I am right now. But what this research has um, done for me is made me ask more questions about these different types of representation in memory. And you notice that I have, I have a small sample size here, but I have a feminine author and I have a masculine author. And then I had masculine uh, male respondents who are journalists and then this female respondent. And I am wondering if I, when I look at this more, I may find gendered representations of what one has to do because La Ferrière himself uh, talks about how women live exile differently. Um, either women who stay behind or women who go. Um, I'm hoping to meet Marie Sevillagnon this summer um, for during my research trip to, to Canada. But there are some interesting questions to be raised there. And, and I always come back to that quote that La Verrière says, you know, sometimes I had to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And there's a piece of me that says, women don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Like the, and I mean, I know I'm overgeneralizing there, but I think that I'm wondering if there may be something that I'll find when I dig more into this literature. But. Um, Thanks for listening. Thanks.